so from last week, I um, wanted to start off simply with, with one verse, sort of a rehash to point out its significance. That's chapter 24, verse 34. Um, in Matthew? In Matthew, yeah, in the Olivet Discourse. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So we discussed heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, that that's a Semitism. Heaven and earth will not pass away, but Jesus' words are even more certain than heaven and earth passing away, which will not happen. So you can place absolute confidence in Jesus' words being realized. So the, uh, that sentence, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place is probably the most controversial sentence in, in the Bible certainly in the New Testament. So it's the, the basis for the search for the historical Jesus, right? Because it was interpreted as the, uh, these words, the, the, all of that discourse from the beginning of verse of 20, chapter 24, verse one, through chapter, the end of chapter 25 was all interpreted as applying to the end times that indicated that either Jesus was a false prophet because heaven and earth, well, because uh, uh, this generation did pass away and also heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, was viewed as kind of an extension of uh, an eschatological statement rather than a Semitism. <clears throat> so it was viewed as him talking about heaven and earth indeed passing away. So for the, so in many ways, that was the, the birth of liberal German scholarship liberal German, liberal not meaning politically liberal, since in fact, one of the liberal German scholars was about to be tried for crimes against humanity at Nuremberg, but he died before the trial began. But it means a you know, re-evaluation of the gospel and a separation of what the historical Jesus said from what the gospel says. So that's a major, major uh, tendency among particularly Lutheran scholars, uh, but, but their methodology has also kind of affected almost all other non-evangelical scholars. So it's all based on a misunderstanding of what Jesus is saying, this generate, or it's based on a, a misunder, misinterpretation of the Olivet Discourse. They're interpreting it as entirely applying to the second coming when in fact the first half doesn't. And then for our uh, evangelical and premillennial dispensationalist brethren, there's a um, a view that, I mean, there are two views. One, that there's a suspension of time involved and that the important thing is in verse 32, from the fig tree learn its lessons. As soon as the branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, so do you know what the fig tree is, means, symbolizes? Well, actually, nobody. It, it's you, it's silly. It symbolizes the recreation of the Jewish state in 1947 in 
premillennial dispensationalist you know, interpretation, which is you know totally unfounded. That the, the fig tree is just a simple analogy. It has no you know profound meaning in this instance. So the the most so, so I mean th this verse has you know provoked profound misinterpretation and really in many ways a profound attack on the faith uh, because it's a denial of the obvious that indeed this generation did not pass away before all those things took place. And I, I also forgot to mention last week that according to church tradition, when the temple in Jerusalem fell uh, and when you know, there's a massacre in, in Jerusalem as the Romans invaded the city and, and raised the temple, that there were no Christians killed. There were no Christians in Jerusalem during the siege. They had all escaped to Pella, according to Eusebius, because they had recognized Jesus' warning. Interesting. Do we need to read the remainder of the Olivet Discourse? Has everyone read it? Yeah. Well, you could read it if you want, but I've read it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it'll take uh, it'll take quite a while. I mean, it's the end to the end of chapter. 20. It's to the end of chapter twenty five. So yeah, yeah. it's a chapter and a half. So so it starts with, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So we had started by saying that the disciples asked two questions. And Jesus answers them in order. The first is, um, "What will be the sign? Mm -hmm. When will this be?" Is the first question. And what will be the sign of your coming? They use the word parousia, and of the close of the age. When will this be? Is when will no stone be left unturned? And Jesus has answered that. And now he's going to discuss the sign of his coming and the close of the age. So the close of the age is the close of the church age. So I was saying that uh, in verse 36, Jesus addresses the second question raised by the disciples. The first was, when will this be? The second is, what will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age? And so the close of the age is the end of the church age and the second coming. And as we'll read in Revelation, hopefully, the new heaven and the new earth. So he says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the son, but the father only. So he's saying that when the disciples ask, what will be the sign of your coming? He says that there will be no sign of his coming. And then he talks about its unexpectedness. For some reason, our separated brethren here see it as being about stealth. But it's not about stealth. It's about unexpected. People were eating and drinking, marrying and, and, and giving in marriage. And suddenly the end has come. They're unprepared. They didn't know very much like during the Noah and the flood. So he says, watch therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the householder had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not let have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So the message here is to be prepared. So then the question becomes, what do you need to do to be prepared? So Jesus tells a number 
of parables to sort of illustrate that. The first is the wise and the faithful servant. The first, the, the, this can be you know, the same servant who behaves in two different ways. This can be a good servant and a bad servant. It, it really doesn't matter. But the first servant, the wicked servant, decides his master is delayed. And so he beats and oppresses the fellow slaves. He eats and drinks and get drunk. And he basically takes advantage of the master's absence. So implicitly, had he known when the master is coming, he would have then cleaned up his act. But he doesn't know. So the message here is to always be prepared, to not assume that you can let things lapse and sort of clean them up at the last minute because you don't know what that last minute is. And then we have the parable of the, the uh, 10 maidens, the, the, ten, the five wise ones and the ten foolish, five foolish ones. So they, the five wise ones come equipped, ready to deal with the delay of the bridegroom. The five foolish ones don't, and as a result, they don't have oil, and they're unable to fulfill their role of leading the bridegroom into the banquet hall. So they're unprepared. They didn't have the foresight to think that the bridegroom might be delayed. So obviously, I mean, here this is part of a, a more broader analogy of the bridegroom and, and his bride, Jesus as the bridegroom, the bride as the church. So those who are unprepared, those who are not, don't have the foresight, those who make fixed assumptions about the coming of Christ, those who you know, sort of have hardened opinions about what the signs are, and therefore are caught unprepared, are judged unfavorably. Then we have the parable of the talents, where three servants are given, given talents, one five, one two, and one one. And the one with the one dug it in the ground. So the interesting thing about this is that the word talent in English owes its origin to this parable. So talent didn't mean, you know, sort of a skill or a gift until um, about the 15th century in English. But nevertheless, talent is a um, it says to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. So in some sense, a talent is a measure of what can be done based on your ability, which in turn is a gift of God's grace. And so the wise, the, the first two good servants use their talents and multiply them. And the, the third one digs it into the, buries it. Now, the interesting thing about that is culturally, the wise thing to do would be to bury it. There's an element of um, I guess sort of shocking scandal you know, in this parable 
uh, Jesus says to the third one, you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. But that's really sort of a strange statement since banking institutions were really non-existent and um, you know, lending money was considered largely, you know, sort of immoral, disreputable, shady, and certainly highly risky. So the good chance, there's a good chance that, you know, if you give your money to somebody as an investment, you're going to lose your investment. So then the question becomes, why is Jesus talking about money? Why is Jesus encouraging unsafe investments? Why is Jesus doing, you know, sort of deriding the servant who culturally did what everyone, did the safe thing and would do what everyone else would do and actually did what the rabbis, in fact, at the time considered the, the best thing to do to preserve the money that somebody had entrusted to you. So anyone have any idea what that might be? Why is he using really a disreputable example? Well, it, could it be, you know, they aren't out there sharing, uh, you know, um, what they've, you know, learned from Jesus? Mm. You know, they're keeping it all to themselves. Right. Right, it's being buried in the ground and not used or displayed. And, and it's also safe. Part of the point here is that the first two took a risk. Right, the second they, one wanted to stay safe. The third one wanted to stay safe, right. So they, the first two took a risk. It, yeah. it, in this case, it paid off and they were, you know, they multiplied the, the master's talents double. But nevertheless, the important thing is not so much that, you know, it returned capital as that, that they took a risk and they did something. They didn't do the safe thing. Right. So, you know, in some sense, I mean, it, we can look at it as, it as kind of a continuation of, of Jesus, uh, you know, critique of Judaism that, you know, you sort of observe the ritual, you right. do the stuff that's required, you know, you pray, you, although you pray, although as he argues, you're not really praying, you're speaking to be seen in the presence of others. And you're not really giving all, although you're giving alms, your motive is your own glorification, not service right. of human need. And you're fasting, not for spiritual reasons, but to enhance your reputation. And so, you know, you practice safe religion and safe religion leads to condemnation. So the message here is that being prepared requires stepping out of one's comfort zone. It requires taking a risk. And it requires not practicing safe Christianity in our case. Unfortunately, many of us do practice safe Christianity. And the, the implication there is that when Christ comes, we're not ready. Then comes the separation of sheep from the goats. Then we have, then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, O blessed of my father. This is uh, verse 34. Mm -hmm. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, O blessed of my father. 
Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. They will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Then that tells us the criteria involved in being prepared, along with the parable of the talents. We have to take risks. And what is that risk? You have to treat everybody, you know, with love as if they were Jesus. Right. Or you God, have to you know, see, right. in the, yeah. You have to see the face of Jesus in everybody. Right. And that's what you need to do to be prepared. Yeah. Which in turn goes back to the last parable. That's really taking a risk. Mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't come naturally or easily for us. But we have to see the face of Jesus in everybody including those who we don't like, those who we hate, mm -hmm. those who we can't stand. Nevertheless, everyone bears the divine image. Right. So are there any questions about this? About the Olivet Discourse? This was really a rapid and uh, sort of hasty overview. Well, it sounds just more of um, the fact that many of the uh, evangelistic type Christians seem to not want to accept anything that is too difficult for them, which is similar to not accepting the papacy, not accepting any authority. It's gonna, going to keep them from being able to interpret everything their way. Mm -hmm. Also going back to, truly I say to you this generation, Will not pass away till all these things take place. Right. You know, for the for the um, you know liberal German school, they at least understand the um, this generation to be literal, and you know, so they conclude that these things have not taken place, and so they decide that Jesus didn't really prophesy in the Olivet Discourse that this was an edition of Matthew or the gospel writers and, you know, reflected an, an, an expectation of the second coming 
And so therefore we had to return to, or we had to uh, demythologize the, the gospel as, as Biltman called it. Um, so, you know, however problematic, so in, in some sense that means that, you know, the implication of that is that Jesus was a moral and ethical philosopher, hmm. but nothing more. You know, he was a guy who, he was a Jewish holy man who happened to you know, sort of found a religion. So, you know, a good guy. Hmm. Can't go wrong with Jesus. So, you know, that's that's problematic, but at least it, you know, kind of starts off, at least it recognizes the obvious meaning of this generation. The rest of the conclusions are problematic, <laughs> but at least they recognize the, the validity, of the, they recognize the meaning of the first two words, and that has to be worth something. <laughs> But then we get to our separated brethren and this generation will not pass away. And so this generation becomes something else. I mean, Jesus is talking here to people gathered around him. This is, he's talking to his disciples. This is, you know, his discourse. And it's important, it's an important discourse because this is his last teaching before he dies. And this is his teaching about eschatology. And so there are two eschatological events. The first eschatological event is going to be his death, his resurrection, and his vindication. Clearly the breaking in of God into human history in a very forceful and novel way. And then the second event will be the second coming. And it's especially important to teach, well, about both, but it's especially important to teach about the first, as we discussed last time, because if the church, if, if Jewish Christians remain in Jerusalem, the church may well be destroyed. So it's very important that Christians in Jerusalem recognize the signs and get out in time. And that's why Jesus says to leave nothing behind and flee and pray that if you're a woman, you're not pregnant or pray that it's not the Sabbath because on the Sabbath, the gates are locked. Very difficult to get out of Jerusalem on the Sabbath. So the warning is really to emphasize the urgency. Once the signs appear, once you see the Roman legion surrounding Jerusalem, it is time to get out. And you may not have, you may just have a short window of, opp of opportunity. And the likelihood is that you will perish. So that's important. And it's prophetic. You know, this happened probably in around 60, the, the, uh, Matthew wrote his gospel probably in around 65 to 67. So three to five years before the, uh, the destruction of the temple. And of course, orally, the tradition of Jesus, all of that discourse was likely also preserved. So for our separated brethren, this generation begins to mean the generation that is affected by this or the generation of the fig tree in a chapter in verse 32, which means the restored Israel, which is, you know, playing with words. This generation has an obvious meaning. It has to be the people to whom Jesus was speaking. It's absurd 
to think that it can apply to somebody else. And especially who would think that the generation of the fig tree is the restored Israel? That's ridiculous. So, so this is really very, the all of that discourse is really very, very important. It's important to recognize that it is fulfilled prophecy in the first half. And it is a statement that there will be no signs. So if we're looking for signs, we're wasting our time. If we're looking for signs, we're almost, we're implicitly admitting that we're unprepared. Right. Because we should need no sign. We should simply be prepared. And how are you prepared? You don't live comfortable Christianity. You take risks and you, re and you take risks by recognizing that all humankind, every individual bears the divine image. Every individual has the face of Jesus. So the way you treat anybody is the way that you treat Jesus. Yeah. And you'll be judged accordingly. So that's what being prepared means. It doesn't mean I let Jesus into my heart and now I'm saved. Yeah. That's only a fiction. It was the first month I was teaching in, in at Holy Rosary that um, the superintendent of the Catholic schools was a nun, mm -hmm. Mr. Joyce Cox. She came into the school and came into my classroom. And I don't remember the question she asked the students, you know, what, what the phrasing of the question was, but the answer was, you know, all you need to know is love God, love others, serve God, serve others. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it just, it is framed. That was just the big picture for, you know, the 13 years I was there teaching second grade, because you can use that all through, you know, mm -hmm. love God, you love others, right. serve, God, serve right. others. And I just kind of got the hand signal too. And they would repeat it. Love God, love others, serve God, serve others. Mm -hmm. you take it just through not just religion, but certainly that was just the big umbrella. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest gift. Of course, I was of course, sweating, thinking, oh my gosh, is anybody going to be able to answer what she's asking? But, you know, she just said it, and she's just so kind, and it was so... Yeah, that's a good summary. But it's still, it's still, for any of us, love yeah. God, love others, serve yeah. God, serve others. That, that works. That's a that's really active, good summary. not passive. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, in a lot of ways, let the phrase let Jesus into your heart is not incorrect if we understand it as uh, Jesus would have understood it, which we don't. I mean, letting Jesus right. into your heart is a sentimental thing. You know, I yeah. like Jesus. Right. But, but it's really a call for but, action. Yeah. But one's heart in the in, 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 Jewish culture was both the seed of emotion, but also it represented the totality of who you are, right? So if you let Jesus into your heart, it means that Jesus subsumes you and becomes the totality of who you are, which means in turn that as you go about the world, you behave like Jesus, you imitate Christ. And that means in turn that you see the divine image in everybody. So, you know, within the traditional meaning of, of uh, letting Jesus into your heart, that's an acceptable formulation. In the modern meaning where it's soft, fuzzy, and gee, isn't Jesus, the, the image that I have of Jesus, nice, it's not acceptable. It's, you know, it's really soft, fuzzy and misguided. 
uh, it's very much the same as as believe, which you know has become subjective. It used to mean I subscribe I ascribe to an external truth. Now it means I'm of the opinion that. But there are no. This, this isn't about opinions. Opinions are of no relevance whatsoever. Only truth is of relevance. Let, let's look at Revelation. We can start at verse seven. So the book of Revelation is also written roughly in the same time frame as Matthew's gospel. It's written uh, probably sometime around 67 to 70. It's written before the destruction of the temple. And um, it's a prophecy that John had. And there's a lot of, you know, there are varying, varying interpretations, and a good deal of disagreements. So, you know, what you're getting is um, my take on the matter. Um, so there's an argument that the author was not John, the disciple, was some guy named John. Um, mm. For a variety of reasons, I don't accept that. It, it's argued that it was written after the destruction of the temple. That seems unlikely, you know, in the sense that it's clearly a prophecy about the destruction of the temple. When it was written, you know, the author did not know that it was going to be a uh, book of the Bible. You know, the, the New Testament documents were written for a local audience and then they circulated. So in a prophecy about the destruction of the temple and John closes him in, at the end by saying, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon, amen. Come Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints, amen. So you can certainly bolster the confidence in the fact that I am coming soon by saying that prophecy has already been fulfilled and the remainder will be fulfilled. And you can be as certain of that as you can be of the first portion of the prophecy being fulfilled. But he doesn't say that very much like in Hebrews, which talks about how the old covenant is fading away. In a tightly argued book like Hebrews is, had the temple been destroyed, you would have thought that he would have noted that. So it's argued that that was written after 70 as well. And then people, you know, put it very late and whatever. And, and there are a lot of games played with dating. But these works are clearly written before the destruction of the temple and revelation is prophetic. The uh, many people don't believe that prophecy is real or possible, but prophecy is indeed real and possible. So, so it's written before the destruction of the temple and the bulk of the book of revelation is a prophecy about the destruction of the temple. We then have the beginning of the church age. In, uh, we have the fall of the temple in chapter 19, 
verse 17 and 18, there's the feast of the fowl. Come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both great and small. The angel calls that to all the birds. It's the feast of the fowl. That's the fall of Jerusalem. And then follows about the thousand year reign of Christ and our separated brethren take that literally as a future thousand year reign of Christ. In the church that is the Catholic church and in the pre-Reformation traditions that's considered uh, well, in the Catholic Church, particularly, that's considered heretical. There is no future thousand-year reign of Christ. And St. Augustine clearly you know, indicated that that thousand-year reign of Christ is the church age in which we're living. The thousand years is simply a long time. We don't know when Christ is coming again. It will be a long time, and it will his coming will mark the end of that long time, which is the thousand-year reign of Christ, which is the church age. So we're living in that thousand-year reign of Christ, not to be understood literally. So then we have... When the thousand in uh, verse seven, chapter twenty, when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, will come out to deceive the nations, <coughs> which are at the four corners of the earth, that is Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They marched up over the broad earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the devil is thrown into the lake of fire along with the beast and the false prophet. So then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them. And all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So this is the final judgment. And then we have what follows the final judgment. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So notice the bride and the bridegroom. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. He who conquers shall have this heritage, 
and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then came one of the, the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last, last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the name of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And on the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates, 12 gates for the apostles, the 12 disciples. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them, the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Let's jump to beginning of chapter 22. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. So notice the river of the water of life flowing through the middle of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And as the, the centrality of the tree, the same thing as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and, and the tree of life in, in uh, the Garden of Eden, which St. Gregory of Nyssa argues is really only one tree, the same tree. There shall, be no, the, there shall no more be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall worship him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and night shall be no more. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So a new heaven and a new earth, a reunification, a complete unification of God with his people, an end of death, an end of suffering, an end of need, a, the presence of God always with his people. So that's the so-called end of the world. That many refer to it. It's the new heaven and the new earth. So that's you know, the eschatological hope. That's what history is moving toward. And of course, we don't know when it's moving, when it is. But we do know that it will happen. I was just thinking on line 10 in the epilogue. When then he said to me, do not seal up the prophetic words of this book for the appointed time is near. You know, so no one is to know. So the wicked will continue as they are and the righteous will continue as they are. And, mm -hmm. and so if, you know, um, I mean, there he's saying, do not seal up the prophetic words of this book. You know, so people who um, believe they're going to be able to know the time um it and want to ignore this then um it just shows how wrong they are 
although the sealing up is, is a reference to Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 and 9. So Daniel has, Daniel has a vision of resurrection. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run back and forth. The knowledge shall increase. So that's a reference to that. Whereas Daniel was to shut up the book, it's mm -hmm. now not to be sealed or shut up because um, John is saying that the time is near. Mm -hmm. And part of the time that's near is, is uh, the destruction of the temple, which is what the prophecy is about. Mm -hmm. But also, the time is near also means that we should always live our lives as if the time is near. We should always be prepared for the time coming. In fact, we should be prepared for the time com coming so that it doesn't make any difference whether the time comes or not. Right. And so if we're prepared, we'll be prepared. And if we're not prepared, we'll be evildoers going on doing what we do. Mm -hmm. One question. So uh, we need to look for um, collect collective salvation. Uh, but in, in these parts of the Bible, they say that they will separate the good from the bad ones. So, um, how, well, I know that the good ones will be the very good ones, right? <laughs> but uh, how, how can we can interpret that? Uh, Um, remember the, the parable of the weeds and the tares that, you know, where the, um, householder plants his crops and then an enemy comes and sows weeds. And so the servants want to pull up the weeds, but, but he says, the householder says, you know, no, you'll destroy the, uh, the, the wheat, if you do that, let them grow together and we'll separate them at the time of the harvest. Um, so the, the, the typical, the, the most common interpretation is that within the church will be mixed both you know, the good and the evil, that you know, they'll all be together during the church age in the church as an institution that they you know are not easily separated and can't be separated until the end of time so um, so i think that's probably that's part of the answer to your question, but you're also asking, are, are you also asking about the difference between the church as a collectivity and us individually? Yeah, that we need to, we need, we need to look for a, um, a collectivity, a salvation, but in collectivity. 
So, but even though if we're trying to look for that, at the end will be separations from one people to another. So. Yeah, I mean, ultimately we're judged individually based on you know what we've what we've done and how well we've you know imitated Christ. So you know within the church we see um, you know all sorts of people we see and at in varying stages of their journey. You know, and so we see. You know, we see comfortable Christians who are, who, you know, would bury the talent in the ground. That's not good. Um, we, we at times, you know, I mean, we at times see the church or portions of the church being, you know, off track completely as in, you know, the priestly pedophile crisis. Uh, you know, those are priests who are supposed to be shepherds who are you know, in a very literal sense, eating the sheep. They're, they're, they're you know, bad and evil shepherds. Well, we, we see, um, you know, at times, um, and in individual churches, you know, an encouragement of, you know, comfortable path. Catholicism and passivity rather than activism. And, you know, in other churches, we see, you know, calls to activism uh, to which some people respond and others don't. So, you know, the church remains a very mixed bag. Uh, but within the context of the church as a whole, you know, we, we, we pray that both, you know, from the Pope through the bishops, through our priests, through each individual church, there's one, there's good leadership, although in some cases there will always not be. And we pray that for individual Catholics that we, you know, don't uh, become comfortable Catholics that we you know take responsibility for our faith that we recognize the responsibility to imitate Christ in the world that we attempt to do that that we recognize our failures that we take advantage of the sacraments that we try to be transformed that we go to the eucharist with a spirit of sacrifice that we recognize that we ourselves are the sacrifice that our that our that our sacrifice is to be joined with the sacrifice of Christ and presented before God the Father and that through that and through the outpouring of God's grace that we can be transformed so you know so, you know, the church remains, you know, a very mixed bag. Does that help to answer yeah. your question? Yeah. yeah, and why they say that he will recognize the seven tribes of the church or something like that? But I, and I see the seven angels and the seven bulls. Hmm. Seven last place. What what is it? In um in tw Revelation twenty one, verse nine. Oh, the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke yeah. to me. Oh yeah 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 the, the, the twelve tribes uh huh of the are, uh huh yeah those are from earlier. So seven is is a number of divine completion. Seven is also a number of judgment. So the, the seven angels with the seven bowls indicates that they're they're commissioned to execute 
the judgment of God. So earlier, the, the seven bowls pour out seven woes, which are, you know, part of the um, find their fulfillment in, in the destruction of Jerusalem. And so here they're they're um, they're brought forward. into the new heaven and the new earth. So where nothing unclean shall enter, nor anyone who practices abomination, etc. So the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, that, that, that 12 indicates that here we have a continuity or in some sense, the climax of salvation history through the 12 tribes of the Israelites and through the 12 apostles and through the church age. And now that has produced the end, which is a climax of what has gone before it. Next, we'll do, have a week on premillennial dispensationalist theology. Um, I think it's a sort of important thing to do since underlying of the rapture docu doctrine, underlying um, all of this, you know, crazy theology or crazy Bible interpretation is a, a really flawed theology and, and it's important. And, and a theology that is only about a century and a half old that was an invention of some guy named John Nelson Darby, who most evangelicals have never heard of. So in some sense, you know, if we read Paul, he talks about the unknown God who he identifies as God the Father. Here we have an unknown God for our hmm. evangelical brethren, whose name is John Nelson Darby. And, you know, his teaching is adhered to with... Um, greater seriousness than that of Christ, in fact, has to be adhered to with greater seriousness than that of Christ because he marginalizes Christ. It's really Paul who is important and Christ is, Jesus is secondary. <clears throat> and so most of his much of his teaching is completely at variance with um, anything that has come before it. It's, um, you know, even Calvin would have turned over in his grave. So, it's hopefully we'll just spend a week on it, but and and hopefully can at least there's one video to watch. There may be I'll send out the readings or watchings after class. So you know, do what you can, and we'll try to get through it in a week. But but I think it's an important thing to at least to at least be aware of, and, and then we'll we'll have concluded our, our study of eschatology very quickly, but, uh, and then we can move on.